time, time to start. <clears throat> so good morning, uh, everyone. <clears throat> Very good to see you to day two of the more theoretical part of the, of, of the course, not completely theoretical because all lecturers uh, are, are using Python as well. Uh, so it's a kind of a mixed, um, mixed approach. <clears throat> and, and, and this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm really very happy to be able to introduce to you uh, Professor Martin Bucher. <clears throat> Uh, Martin uh, is, a, is an ETEP associate and, and he's an honorary professor at, at UKZN, but his main job is, in, is as professor uh, in Paris. Yeah? And um, he's also mainly working in, uh, let's say, in cosmology, astrophysics and, um, and other <clears throat> theoretical issues. Uh, but since uh, the pandemic, he, he developed uh, a taste and an interest in, uh, in, 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 in genomics, and in particular in, in, in computational aspects of genomics and in how uh, theoretical physics can try to make a, a contribution to, <clears throat> to understand better the, uh, the pandemic. Yeah? And, and because of that, because, uh, you know, as a physicist, he speaks our language, <laughs> he's probably absolutely well positioned uh, to, to explain to us uh, the basics of uh, epidemiology and, uh, and, and, and genomics. Yeah? So Martin, thank you very much uh, for being with us and, and, uh, and a really great thank you for going through the trouble of, of preparing this, uh, this lecture series because uh, I know that uh, like all of us, you're also very busy. So thank you very much. We really appreciate very much your, your effort and uh, are very much looking forward to your lectures. So Martin, if you would like to start uh, sharing the screen, you are most than welcome to start. And we already started the, the recording of the lecture. So you're ready to go. OK, um, well, thank you very much for um, inviting me to, to give these um, lectures. So let's see. Let me see if I can get the screen to work. Oh. OK, so I guess we want to go to um, full screen mode. Perfect. OK, so um, this is a um, series of, um, of five lectures and um, let me just tell you a little about um, the format and, um, and, and uh, the activities that I would like you to um, take part in. So um, uh, this lecture is going to be a little um, different than the other lectures and that it's going to be, you know, maybe a little more um, applied maths like. Uh, so the general theme is uh, epidemiology, um, uh, genomics and the, you know, connection to theoretical physics and, and computing. Um, so um, I don't want to spend all the time on the lectures. I just want to give you some, you know, very basic ideas about how to uh, model the spread of infectious diseases. Um, and um, also show you, uh, you know, some of the complexity, why it's uh, a hard problem. And then I want to get you um, into doing something yourself. So I have a, um, a Python program that works, that uh, allows you to model, uh, to run the simplest model. And then I'm going to ask you to modify that script um, in, in order to answer some question. And so, so the modification is not super complicated, but uh, the idea is to investigate uh, herd immunity and 
to sort of test one of the claims that we see so often uh, that, um, you know, there's a certain six fixed percentage and everybody thinks they understand. Um, so at the bottom of this uh, slide, I sort of said that um, then the next four lectures, I'm going to um, focus more on genomics, population genetics, mathematical evolution and new strains. Um, so the things I'm going to talk about today, you know, date back to the 1930s and, you know, we have computers and we can make these models, but you can see that, you know, they haven't been terribly successful. Um, they haven't been a terrible failure either, but uh, we would like to talk about what is new in this uh, subject. And um, the thing that I think is really new and hasn't fully been exploited yet is uh, the ease with which you can um, sequence the, well, in the case of the virus, the RNA, um, but more generally uh, DNA of, you know, any organism. So there are uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, COVID genomes that have been uh, sequenced and their mutations as we've heard about in um, there's a sort of massive amount of data and what can you do with it. So that's interesting in terms of uh, COVID-19. Um, but I don't think I want to focus so much on, you know, just this epidemic because the idea of uh, genomics um, it, mainly driven by the large number of the ease with which you can sequence the large amount of data available is something that is going to revolutionize medicine. So there's this sort of buzzword precision uh, medicine where people will, um, based on your genome, know what drugs will work on you and all sorts of things. So personalized medicine. And so I think it's very worthwhile to sort of learn the basic principles behind that. Um, so I'm, since this is a computing school, I'm also going to, um, in course, the course of the lectures, give you um, computing assignments, which you can, um, I don't think we're going to, you know, grade or necessarily collect as a traditional class, but it's sort of an uh, opportunity to see how you can use Python and, and do some sort of practical things that are interesting. So I, I think that's a little more interesting than having just, you know, lectures that you listen to, try to do a few um, simple things. So um, there will be a few more exercises of the sort that we had today. So I'm going to try not to take up uh, all of the time um, talking about modeling that uh, uh, try to get through this lecture quickly so that you can um, uh, get started and you know we will be able to help you also. Okay, let's see. Okay, so um, uh, this first slide just um, puts a uh, bit uh, in, in perspective uh, um, our uh, epidemic and, and um, you can see that uh, throughout human history, there have been, um, you know, huge outbreaks of uh, infectious diseases of, uh, 
you know, various sorts. So by infectious, we mean something that is, you know, spread from person to person. It's not something that sort of spontaneously um, arises in you. And, um, you know, some of these come from viruses, some from bacteria. From the point of view of uh, modeling, it really doesn't uh, matter that much. It's just the fact that uh, one person infects the other who in turn in, in infects someone else. That That is the um, important point in the um, uh, point to think about is that, um, you know, just from looking at this uh, chart that goes back uh, um, over a thousand years is that, uh, well, COVID-19 wasn't the first uh, so-called pandemic and it's not going to be the last. So new diseases um, emerge in various ways and no one is ready for it. And, you know, we, we have to sort of figure out what is, uh, is going on and how to make um, sense of it. Um, here is a uh, um, sort of chart of different um, infectious diseases. And as you probably know, um, R0 is uh, the uh, number of people on the average who are infected by each infected person. So, you, you know, does the, does the chain reaction keep on going or um, do, does it sort of uh, break down and decay um, exponentially? So the question is, whether or not is greater than one or not, because if you, you know, for each person cured, there have, <laughs> have to be more people who carry on the disease. And you can see that there's a lot of uncertainty in measles um, is probably the, um, most uh, infectious disease and you know we can go down and most of these uh, but not all of these diseases are things that um, uh, uh, really ravish the human population um, let's just say um, you know use 1900 as sort of a base state and then um, came along a, um, a whole series of uh, vaccines and this, the childhood death really um, uh, became not such a major thing, um, uh, you know, into the 21st century. Um, so this is sort of one of the great success stories of, of medicine. Um, uh, the history goes back farther uh, with uh, smallpox. Um, uh, for example, um, there, you know, the Chinese had uh, things that were sort of similar to vaccines and, um, uh, you know, but no means as safe as, you know, modern um, vaccines. And then, you know, there are diseases like uh, HIV AIDS and Ebola and the flu um, where there, there isn't, uh, there aren't vaccines that make them go away. So um, one example, so this is the most, uh, um, uh, infectious disease. So it was sort of on the top of our charts with uh, R0, um, with 18 is uh, measles. And you can see this, uh, this is the 
incidents in the United States from 1944 to 2007, and there are data from other country that is quite similar. And um, you can see that there's these sort of uh, oscillations and then there's sort of this dip in these outbreaks. And um, what we, uh, I will go back to this when we uh, discuss the modeling. But um, basically, if we look at um, people um, who were, you know, born um, before, say, I was born in 64. Uh, um, but um, so people, older, much older than me, um, getting the measles was um, uh, almost a, a certainty and you would get these sort of waves. Well, there would be herd immunity, but then new people are born and um, there's sort of a reservoir and instability and then there's an outbreak. Uh, is there a question? Uh, no, Martin. I, I think someone might have uh, switched on by mistake the the microphone. I think. Oh. Don't worry. Oh, okay. just no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will pay. I will play attention. Yeah. Here. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, in understanding these oscillations, if if um, if new people weren't being born, herd immunity you know, where enough people have already caught the disease so that there isn't this passive uh, situation where you, uh, one person infects more than one who in turn infects, uh, you know, uh, even more people and you have this geometric progression. So um, that would just all sort of decay away, but, um, since more people are being born, the, you, you, you sort of get below the herd immunity, then there's an outbreak, and then it stops. And there's also sort of a seasonal effect, and there's a lot of work with, uh, is this every year or every, um, uh, every two years, et cetera, and, and um, yeah, uh, you know, that's an interesting academic question. Um, so the seasonal effect doesn't have to be very large in order to explain these because it's sort of, well, when does it, you know, build up? When does the dam break? So that's what's going on. Then you see the vaccine licensed and, um, you get this sort of uh, amazing, um, uh, almost disappearance, but then there are some outbreaks. And then there also is sort of the story about the anti-vaxxers, um, et cetera. And we see a lot of this repeated now, but um, I mean, measles, most people, um, it wasn't that big of a deal, but you know, then there was a, a sort of 1% or so for which it was a very um, serious disease and cause of, of death. And there were a lot of other diseases and a lot of these have been eradicated by vaccines. Um, and it's sort of ironic that um, people today are so concerned about the uh, vaccine safety and uh, sometimes to the extent of sort of losing sight of, well, you know, if you're going to die in this uh, time of something related to say COVID-19, it's probably going to be the disease itself and not the vaccination. So we always have to put risks into into perspective, and, and that's really um, important. Okay, let's go on to um, uh, modeling. So 
I think here um, the sort of skill is to, um, you know, take a model and put it into equations and then sort of understand the equations. And you know, um, this is, you know, we can make more complicated models, but the basic idea is very simple. So um, uh, I, I want to go over this in the code that I um, am providing you uh, um, implements this model with some sort of reasonable um, set of parameters. So, and I also want to go over the assumptions, which are if the simplest model here, which are almost certainly wrong, um, uh, so that you can see what the limitations are and also how to extend the model. So we um, first of all assume that everyone is the same and uh, connected to other people in the same way. So there's a homogeneous population and people here I draw this uh, sort of set of arrows S to I to R. So uh, you're, um, you start out as being uh, susceptible to catching the uh, infectious disease. Then in, um, as a result of some sort of contact with somebody uh, who was infected during the time when, you know, they can spread the disease, you become infected. So mathematically, um, this is sort of like um, um, double entry accounting, one uh, uh, unit or one person is removed from this population S and moved to this population I. And then um, you're sick for a certain amount of time. And uh, then you, you recover, but while you're infected, uh, you can um, infect other people. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> um, let, let's just look at how to put this in, in mathematics. So we have um, basically three um, continuous variables that uh, depend on time, the S, I, and T. And we're going to assume a, a closed population. So no one dies, no one is born, and this is perfectly sensible when we're sort of looking on a, a short time frame. So if we were doing COVID-19, uh, the last, you know, uh, year plus a few months, um, this would be a reasonable uh, assumption that we can ignore births and we can ignore deaths to some extent. Well, um, uh, since the probability of dying is, uh, you know, in the percent range, um, this is sort of the least inaccuracies of the, the model. Okay, so we have um, uh, the time derivatives, and then we have these, uh, these terms. So there's a, a nonlinear term, um, I, S, which represents a, a contact between um, somebody infected and somebody who um, is, is susceptible. So here we're assuming that the recovered people have uh, acquired some immunity and the immunity is, you know, forever in our, our model. Um, so um, this term is negative and it's taking somebody out of the S class 
in putting them into the I class. So you see um, uh, uh, two entries with opposite signs. And then um, if we just had those terms, then you know everybody would become infected and stay that way, but we sort of um, want to represent in the case of uh, COVID that uh, uh, people recover. So the simplest way to incorporate this into a model is to just um, uh, uh, add a decay term. So this is just sort of, if we just had the second term, this would be like the equation for, you know, radioactive decay of uranium atoms or something like that. Um, and then they get added to this um, recovered um, class. So if we were <clears throat> going back to say the measles plot where um, we were sort of looking at these uh, oscillations, um, we would need to add terms to inject um, new people into the susceptible population, people being born, and, um, and, and then um, the people dying, and so that it wouldn't be sort of a close population. And we could do that with the same sort of um, uh, techniques. Okay, so let's look at um, what is uh, um, okay, so the total population is uh, is conserved. Um, everybody is like everybody else. So everybody, you know, you go out and you see the same number of people. That's obviously not realistic. The other thing that is <clears throat> a bit unrealistic here is that um, here people are, you know, a continuous variable. So um, there's no place for stochastic effects and you can have um, an epidemic uh, um, die out with a thousandth of a person infected on the average and then regenerate. So that's obviously not realistic because the number of people in a certain population is um, an integer and not a continuous variable. So this is another um, sort of shortcoming of the, the model. Um, and then the other thing that is sort of put in here that uh, probably isn't so bad, but uh, is certainly not accurate in detail is um, if we look at a person infected, we get um, the amount of time you're um, infected as sort of a governed by an exponential distribution. Um, so, you know, that's not what the way it works. Uh, we sort of know that there's sort of a, a cycle of sort of a week or two, et cetera. And, you know, no one gets cured who's infected gets cured in the first two days and it sort of generally doesn't go on with a very long tail, although there's some exceptions to this. So a lot of this has been, um, you know, what goes on has been coarse grained into these variables. And if you, um, you know, just are worried about the general numbers, well, you can probably fit the data by choosing these uh, variables well, but there might be certain lags and things that are um, not accurately accounted by this model. So I'm just uh, sort of offering you a, a critique of the um, model so that you can sort of see how 
the model can be um, modified. Okay, let's see. Okay, so the other uh, uh, sort of very unrealistic um, assumption in this model is that these uh, coefficients don't vary with time. So obviously, if uh, let's go to the beginning of the, you know, um, epidemic uh, in, in France, where I live, um, at the beginning, it was sort of uh, the numbers were doubling every three days, I remember, in, um, you know, beginning March uh, 2020. So people basically continue their lives and um, they don't take any um, precautions and, you know, they don't think it's going to be a big deal that it'll all blow over. You know, it was sort of the same in South Africa where people uh, came up with all this, uh, oh, well, there's no community infection, um, stuff about the weather, seasonal effects. And, but once something turns out to be a major problem, people, um, change their behavior. And, you know, this term, the uh, gamma, where people have contacts and it, it's sort of uh, affected by behavior, whether people wear masks, et cetera, um, maybe a lot less with uh, this uh, gamma parameter. Um, but, um, you know, this is this is something you can't really fit from first, first principles. Okay, so um, this is, uh, uh, I think in, in theory, you need to um, uh, keep in the back of your mind how well you expect your models to work. And um, one of the big problems with this kind of uh, um, model is that you can have um, lots and lots of parameters, but then you don't have any way of uh, fitting them and it becomes a, a big problem. So um, uh, this is an argument in, in favor of sort of simpler models that are um, perhaps wrong and something to keep in, in mind. Um, Okay, so uh, we might want to do better. And so we can um, divide the population into, you know, different age groups, um, uh, older people are generally um, don't have such strong immune systems. So, you know, you would just add another index, um, you might want to add uh, categories for people like, uh, you know, people who work in grocery stores, policemen, doctors, nurses have lots and lots of contact with each other and people, other people, and then there are uh, people who, um, live alone and sort of do white collar work from their house and are sort of almost like hermits. So you could make different categories uh, for those. You could uh, maybe some people based on age or something else would um, be have a higher viral load. And then there's also sort of the geographical aspect people um, uh, have the most contact with people sort of near them. So there's lots of um, sort of room for embellishment on this um, simplest model that I, I showed in the um, previous transparency. 
so mathematically uh, we could add indices. So the susceptible people, for example, would uh, be divided into M categories. And, you know, we could have multi indices where, uh, you know, one might be age, one might be your um, uh, contacts with other people, uh, the uh, state of your immune system, et cetera. And, you know, this looks a little like uh, general relativity with uh, um, index after index after index. So this is sort of familiar to theoretical physicists. And um, uh, the problem with this is that, well, you know, we could easily make a model with a thousand parameters, but how are we going to determine these parameters? So the model might be more correct, but we don't know what the parameters are supposed to be. So it's not, uh, not super useful necessarily. Um, okay, um, let's uh, look at other things that we could add. Um, so this is uh, a quote from the times before the uh, measles vaccine. So the chance of uh, catching measles using um, a sort of naive estimate was uh, about 95%. Uh, percent. So catching measles is as inevitable as death and taxes. So this is sort of a, a rite of passage. So this is the um, from some medical journal. Um, so here we introduce um, the we we have our simple model in black, but we inject new people into the population with this term alpha. So this is new births. And then people die here independent of what uh, category they belong to. Um, so this allows you to go away from herd immunity. And then if you would want to um, uh, perhaps but in these sort of seasonal variations, you might have a constant term plus, uh, you know, cosine every year or something like this. And if we add up um, all these categories, this is sort of our birth death um, uh, equation. Um, it it uh, makes a prediction that's patently wrong that uh, the age distribution is sort of exponential, but um, it allows you something simple to play with without adding more variables. Um, okay, there's um, a lot of data and um, I'll just show you this um, because I think uh, this is, um, you know, really shows how much things have changed with uh, vaccines. So here we have age, and this is the percentage of people surviving, you know, up to a, a certain age. And um, let's see, this, this is 1900. I believe this curve is 1950, uh, and one of these is sort of the present, and one of this is projected. Um, this is from the U.S. in the uh, yeah, yeah here here are the dates the Social Security Administration, so they need to predict how people long people are going to live. And if we took South African data, it would be somewhat similar. I just couldn't find it. But you see that um, uh, 
in 1900, about uh, uh, one out of five children did not survive till the age of um, five years. So you had all these childhood deaths from childhood diseases. And by 1950, um, this is, you know, down to a few percent. And now it's sort of down to, to nil almost that everyone um, survives uh, childhood um, almost, at least in uh, developed countries. And vaccines are what explains this huge difference in shape of the curve. And then here you see sort of the longevity. Um, so you could make a more complicated model that would uh, um, uh, include the age distribution, um, uh, you, you know, rather than making this exponential prediction. And, you know, we could talk about how to do that mathematically. But I just wanted to show this because this is sort of the killer plot to show the tremendous success of vaccines, despite you know, all the anti-vaxxer claims. Um, this is a major game changer. Um, here's a plot uh, comparing the French population, the sort of age distribution with the South African population. And you can see that uh, in South Africa, um, the population is, you know, very young. And, um, and, and that really affects um, death rates in the present um, epidemic. Um, it, it, I mean, if you would want to predict deaths, you could just take these figures in um, you know, put that in uh, a model and come up with a rather accurate uh, um, uh, explanation of the, you know, difference between um, different uh, countries. Okay, so um, I don't want to, this is sort of a detail, so I will go through this quickly, but if we would want to <clears throat> um, uh, uh, model people getting older, we could do this with a uh, um, uh, partial differential equation or we could discretize in this way. So here you have the sort of wave that moves from you know, younger to older, A is the age. And then we take um, people out of this population according to this mortality function. And um, this can be approximated with a, um, an ODE. We could also do the, you know, how long people are infected if we wanted to add more detail by having a long uh, factor, but I don't really, um, I'll just include the slide um, uh, in case you want to um, look at embellishments. Okay, so um, beginning of an epidemic, uh, everyone is uh, susceptible um, and no one is infected. And <laughs> the relevant question to ask is if one person uh, from a country that is uh, infected arrives, you know, are they just going to get a few people sick, but it uh, kind of uh, is what we would call an engineering, a transient, you know, some event that happens and decays away. Or does this, um, you know, solution where no one is infected, is this uh, stable? So this is the same as the 
mathematics of a chain reaction, spontaneous combustion, a pyramid scheme in finance or um, the, the same kind of thing. Well, one event, you know, sort of um, at least in a linear theory lead to a solution that goes out of control and then, you know, nonlinear effects will um, kick in. So um, we can um, do some uh, computations, you know, based on the linear theory where we just uh, put S equal to the number of people in the population. And then we get this sort of exponential um, solution in, um, in if, if, if it, even if this is varying with time, this is, you know, we don't need to do any um, simulations, but, you know, the sign of this uh, zeta determines whether um, an epidemic will take off or not. So this is, you know, something we do in applied maths all the time. We try to linearize about some solution and look at stability. And you don't need any computers till, you know, S starts changing significantly. And then you can't solve the um, equation anymore. So if we sort of follow this uh, R0, um, the basic reproduction number in terms of this model, well, this is the decay of uh, one person who's infected. And then this is the chance that they infect one other person. So you can sort of figure out um, when this is greater than one and when this is less than one. So will there be a chain reaction? And then nonlinearity cuts things off and you get this sort of uh, fraction of people uh, who get infected for herd immunity, you know, um, when this number of people is recovered or um, infected, then there's no longer any instability. So we will look at uh, whether this is a firm prediction or just an artifact of the simplicity of the model. Um, I don't want to get too much into the, the data, but um, you can see by now the data is complicated and you know there are many peaks and this is probably um, largely because of behavior and um, not so easy to, to explain. So um, you, here's also the website and you can spend lots of time trying to sort of make sense of the, the data. Um, so behavior, um, well, um, you know, not everybody participates. This is a slide from spring break in the US. It's sort of the height of the epidemic and, you know, lots of people don't care. And of course there's a lot of spreading and um, um, the same thing in, in France. And uh, I included these slides just to um, emphasize the effect of behavior and what politicians and other leaders say, and you know, that that's super important and not easy to uh, model mathematically. Um, let's see. So I'm going to go to the numerical part now. Um, uh, that I think there's, um, as bad as these models are, and I've uh, tried to be upfront about, uh, you know, the limitations of any particular model, um, that having some sort of fundamental model that accounts for people 
transmitting to other people um, is, you know, certainly on the right track. And there were lots of, uh, like at the beginning of the pandemic, really, in my opinion, stupid papers with fitting functions um, without any theoretical um, justification. Um, so you should trust sort of the qualitative conclusions from these simple models, but not, you know, necessarily, well, this will happen half a year from now. Um, is one tries to add more realism, the number of parameters blows up and you just don't have the data to um, uh, fit these parameters. There may be some possibilities of geno with genomics to um, have uh, lots and lots of data uh, with, uh, you know, detailed measure transmission um, uh, statistics. And so this is something that we could look at. Um, there's a very nice book from the 90s where on mathematical epidemiology and the author has a sort of plot, well, what are the fraction of papers that actually use data and it's minuscule. So this is sort of a domain for applied mathematicians proving um, theorems. Um, this is from Robert Schiller's book. So he won the Nobel Prize in Economics for um, uh, um, including um, behavior on um, economic events and this, you know, could be the stock market and you can see the, these, these little um, animal characters and how they're reacting. We certainly have that going on. Um, okay, so let's go to um, doing something practical. So, um, First, I wanted to make a few remarks about um, it, numerical issues. And um, this is from the SIP um, page. So um, there are all these libraries and we're mainly going to use the SIP library, which has all sorts of uh, um, really useful routines. So we're going to be interested in ODE solvers. And just as a general um, uh, remark about solving scientific problems and, you know, computing is that whenever possible, you want to use uh, sort of general purpose routines that uh, people have worked on for a long time and they've been perfected and they're fast. And so if there's something available that does what you want it to do, you're much better using these routines rather than reinventing the wheel. And um, my experience has been that often you think that uh, programming something from scratch is you know, not that hard, but it turns out to be a lot more time consuming. So it's important to know where to, to look for these things. So here, um, uh, I look, uh, this is from the web page with the SIP package, and you can see there special functions, integration, optimization, interpolation. And it's useful just to know how to uh, find these things. And, um, and, and so we'll, we'll look at the um, ODE routines. Um, I also want to mention, um, it's also good to 
know what is the math and you know what happens inside these black boxes. So if you just look at the SIP um, documentation, then you will find um, you know just what are the inputs, what are the outputs. Um, numerical recipes is this uh, book that is uh, uh, published well by Cambridge University Press, and it was its best selling book next to the official Anglican Church Bible. Um, so that's sort of an interesting um, um, thing about this book. So there are so many people who uh, use um, numerical computing and recipes means that they tell you a little about the technique and they provide programs. And um, the old versions of these uh, books are available online. So you can, you know, if you go to my lecture notes, you can find this and you can click on this and you can read uh, the information about the routines that, um, uh, how they work, and there are also references. So this is a great source. I wouldn't recommend actually using their routines because, for example, um, Python with the SIP library has, you know, much the same, or there's the GSLC library, and, and I think those are, are better. Okay, so um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show this to you on, um, uh, uh, on the screen. So I'll just make this program run, but I included the listing. So I have a, a sample program which runs an SIR model. And here I have some parameters that I've sort of fine tuned to give you something a little similar to COVID-19. Um, um, and um, then I run this. Um, there are many ways to run IPython, but I use Matt, um, IPython, and um, I can just run the script and you know, change it in an editor. And um, yeah, these are the plots. And let's, here's the exercise. So let me just um, explain what I would um, like you to do. So um, this program has just uh, one category of, of people. So everyone is the same. Everyone has the same uh, contacts. And um, it, one thing very simple one can do is we can um, double the number of variables so that there are two classes. There are people who are, you know, Maybe you could call them the super spreaders. Um, they uh, have lots and lots of contacts with other people. And then another group, which um, has many less contacts with the first group and among themselves. So this is obviously just a simplification. So <laughs> why do I uh, suggest this problem? or exercise, why is it interesting? Well, um, uh, at the beginning of the epidemic and still now, um, maybe um, there's a lot of talk about what r not is. And uh, people make this prediction on the very simple-minded model that, you know, there's this uh, fraction of people who need to be infected till you have herd immunity. So if you 
you know, listen to the TV and, you know, these public health experts, it's sort of like, oh, well, if you know anything about epidemiology, this is the formula and it's 60, 70 percent that have to get infected. So is this really true? So what I'm suggesting is um, how about taking a group of people and they just infect each other. So you get this really rapid rise of R naught. And then that, that those people all um, infect each other, but then they've uh, within their group um, achieved herd immunity and, um, and, and then there's much less spread among the second group and you get a much smaller fraction of people who need to be infected or vaccinated in order to have the epidemic go away. So this sounds like a, a sort of plausible plan to prove the experts wrong um, with a very slightly more complicated model. Um, but, you know, it's easy to fool yourself with arguments. Sometimes when you put the numbers in, things don't work out as well as you want. So you should um, try it yourself and we could maybe make a, um, even make a contest uh, how low you could um, make this fraction with a, you know, very high apparent uh, R naught um, at the beginning. Okay, so this is the, um, let's see. So I would like to, the end of my slides and what I would like to do is um, just show you, um, can people read the, the text on my screen? Is it big enough? Okay, so yes, Martin, the text is big enough. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so let me just uh, um, go through this um, script uh, quickly, line by line. I'm just going to highlight stuff. Um, so I um, import the libraries and the IP integrate is the you know most uh, important library that has the ODE integrator and um, here I define a function that um, uh, represents the differential equation so you can see um, this uh, uh, S, I, and R are the variables, and they're unpacked from a numpy factor, and then the derivatives are returned. And then here I have some um, initial values. So epsilon is um, a number that is supposed to be very small. Here, um, the, the, these numbers are not actual people, but fractions of the population. Um, so I want this to sort of add up to one. No one's recovered. Very few people are infected and almost everyone is susceptible. And here, um, these initial conditions are packed into an array. And this is the time, uh, you know, I wanna start at time zero. Um, that's arbitrary because time isn't um, in, it, it doesn't appear in this uh, differential equation and uh, um, continue for 50 units of time. So let me go to, um, let's see. Uh, I just want to show you the uh, documentation so that you can sort of see how you would find out about this routine. And um, 
it's really worthwhile to go through these, uh, you know, SIP pages just to um, see what is available. Um, so developer's guide, we don't want to, um, let's see, I think this is the, the reference guide, I think is what we want. So here are the different types of, um, of uh, routines that are available and you, you have to import them with, uh, you know, SIP dot whatever the category is. So um, ODE solvers or ordinary differential equation solvers are under um, integration. Um, it's not that obvious. And then we, uh, this is how to do definite integrals and we want to go to ODE int. Um, so let's see. I'm just showing you this because um, I sort of want you to see if you had a problem, how would you find the routine rather than me telling you, oh, well, um, it's SIP dot, you know, whatever, how would you find it? Um, so as I mentioned, um, these are special um, general purpose functions. So the general scheme is you have a, a vector y then in the dependent uh, variable is uh, independent variable is t. And this can be, have one component or it can have you know, three in our case or a thousand, um, uh, the routine uh, doesn't care. That's something the user puts in. And this is the, you know, basic scheme. So almost every differential equation can be put into the scheme and they give you some um, examples here. Um, so I think I, I'm not um, the solve initial value problem. Let's just click on this. So you can see um, uh, the listing and in general, you don't need to look at all of the um, options. You probably, um, just need the, the sort of basic things. So you put in a, a callable function. So this defines your differential equation. You put in the um, uh, initial time and the final time, and then the um, initial value of the y factor. And then there are different methods. This is Rungakada uh, 45, which is a fifth order method, and it uses a fourth order method in the comparison to estimate the error. Um, uh, a few interesting comments. I went and looked at uh, when was the Rungakada method um, developed. And it's actually rather clever. And it was the first paper was 1895 and 1901. So this is way before uh, computers. And most of the problems in numerical analysis were figured out way before, you know, these things were practical. And such is the case with a lot of science, you know, when things are hot, most of the things have already been done. Um, I'm going to use an uh, um, option called dense output, where you get an interpolation function and you evaluate it. And I, I didn't have to do that. But you can read all of this. And, you know, this is very uh, useful. And then usually you can, the return arguments is some important. 
and their references and they're often example programs. So it's easiest, I think, uh, from my experience, if you find a routine to just find a simple example, you know, rather than reading over all the options. Um, okay, so this is sort of, um, oops, I didn't go to the right window. Okay, so solution, um, if everything goes right, um, this will solve the differential equation. And um, the uh, solution has all sorts of details about what happened, the estimated errors. But here I have a interpolation object, which is sort of like a callable function. And I want to um, find the values on this, you know, from zero to 20 with 100 points. And then I, I plot these points. And then this is sort of, um, I could have put more time, um, uh, but this is kind of related to the R naught, not exactly. So, um, uh, I'm taking the ratio of, um, you know, the sequence of infected uh, persons from one indice started zero in in um, Python. So this um, chops off the first uh, um, element of this tabulated factor, and then this notation means minus one is um, you, you, you go up to one from the end or one away from the other end. So this is sort of the ratio. And then I have a, a log plot. So I'm going to um, run this um, program. Let's see. Well, I can just quit because I haven't changed anything. Um, So the, this this program is in the in the Moodle, um, and, and and so you can download it. And I would suggest you run it yourself, and then you know modify the um, program to have these um, two categories, and then sort of play around with it yourself, and you know try to understand the output. Okay, um, I actually don't need to, um, for various reasons um, in IPython um, uh, with Matplotlib, um, things work better when you um, introduce this uh, percent matplot command. So that um, affects the way the routines are, are run um, and, and then I can, well, I think I renamed it. So um, I'll just put the name down. Um, so this will run the program um, in this file. And it, it, I find it easier to have another window open and I can edit and change things and then just type this because I like my favorite editor. Um, for me, it's VI, others might like Emacs, but um, anyway, I run this um, program and then I get these, uh, this uh, plot and you can, um, I didn't label the populations, um, but you can sort of figure it out. The blue is the number of susceptible people. Um, the number of recovered people is, um, it is uh, 0.6. And then uh, 
at the end. So you're you're sort of uh, approaching and uh, herd immunity asymptotic. And then this orange curve is the number of people infected. So at about time six or so, there's a maximum and then it goes down. So I played around with the parameters. So you get the sort of 60%, which is the herd immunity. And if you want to make your a uh, more complicated model with two categories. You sort of would want um, this line where it's the number of infected people, how much it's changing at each time step to be about this. So that the epidemiological data with the growth is the you know same with the two categories and the one category. So you can just play around and put in different um, parameters. I could have converted this into R0, but um, I just didn't, wanted to keep the program simple. And this is, you know, um, very closely related. I also did another plot where I took the logarithm of the number of people infected and you can sort of see um, there's an exponential. Um, so this is, I believe the log base 10, I'm not, it might be base C, I forget, but a, a straight line is uh, exponential um, expansion or, or growth. And then, you know, it turns, turns into a decay. But um, I think also one of the um, important skills in um, Python and numerical computing is to, you know, think carefully about what to plot and how to plot it. If I had a linear plot, you know, you can't tell by eye what is uh, exponential and what isn't, but, uh, you know, log linear plot um, makes this abundantly um, clear. So I have given you a working program to play with. Um, and let me just make sort of one final remark so that if you change, so you might ask, well, how does the program know the number of dimensions? So um, if the program is running, um, it just has a, um, well, I guess in C language, you would call it a pointer to a function. It's a reference or whatever. So that isn't much information, but um, uh, the routine can sense the, um, you know, this is a numpy array and it uh, figures out what is the, you know, number of parameters. So, you know, you, you just add, um, add more degrees of freedom and rewrite this function and you can um, uh, make the model. You probably want to have, I mean, you, you want to have more than one alpha um, because, you know, one among the first group and then one uh, coupling the second group to itself and, um, and to the first group. So you, you're just adding one parameter. I would advise against adding more. And I just, uh, you know, invite you to play and try to answer this question, which I stated more um, carefully on the, on the slides. So that's all I wanted to say for today. So maybe we, um, this is a good time to stop for, for questions or discussion. Martin, thank you very much. Uh, so 
dear participants, please, if you have any questions, raise your hand or you can type your question or probably you can, if we're going to be organized, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. I mean, it may be that you um, need to, a chance to go away and and you know play with the, the program your, yourself, and 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 um, we can start the next lecture with uh, questions and a, a discussion. But are, are there any? Are there any questions now about um, the exercise or any of the issues that we? You know, Martin. You know, Martin. Maybe you can repeat the exercise so that you know if the people haven't got it, what they're supposed to do because they have a code which you gives and it's working. But okay, so now what they need to do? Oh, okay. Um, so let me go back to the, um, let's see, sharing the screen and let's see. Yep. Um, so because your original code was just implementing your very simple SIR model, yes? Right. So I think that, um, the key uh, programming, um, the key programming task is in this uh, first paragraph. So modify the program so that rather than there just being one category of people divided up into SIR subclasses, there are two categories of people so one group is, you know, the people who, with lots and lots of contacts. So they would have a very high, you know, coupling to each other. Mm -hmm. And um, then the second group. So you need to um, uh, have, um, I mean, there's no sense in using arrays rather than SIR, S1, mm -hmm. I1, R1. S2, S, I2, R2. So you- Okay, and, and sorry, Martin, did these groups interact with each other as well? So, because I understand that uh, there is a strong kind of uh, transmissibility within the groups, but is there any interaction between the groups and how that is uh, assumed to be? So in okay. one group, you have a very strong transmissibility. In, in one, you have very weak. But did they interact with each other? Well, um, yeah, they have to. Um, they have to interact with each other. Otherwise, um, you're 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 just running two models and uh, you know two yep, yep. disconnected populations within the same um within the same code so you're not really doing anything new um so it, it, what i would suggest is um i mean we could take uh it is the first step we could just rewrite the model where a certain fraction is in you know, group one and the other fraction is in group two. And, you know, that that would be one minus that fraction and you have the same coupling constants. So you have to write, um, I guess, six alpha terms, you know, mm -hmm. rather than, um, uh, than just two. And then what I would do is for this, um, very gregarious population, I would add another, I don't know, I, 
would call it maybe an alpha plus term where um, they're coupled to each other um, more strongly. So there's sort of this extra term and, and, and then you, know, you, you have to make plots and you want to keep the growth rate. Yeah, so you, you, you may, um, you first get the program to run and you look at um, all six, um, you know, subpopulations and how they evolve with time. And then you could uh, do, you know, I is equal to I1 plus I2 and look at the statistics, the growth factor that, you know, I had printed out and try to choose the parameters so that they're the same. But you have, you know, you have um, alpha, alpha, alpha plus to play with. I wouldn't, um, I would keep the gamma term the same because that's how long people are infected. Um, yeah, so you might first want to write down the differential equation on a sheet of paper and um, uh, make sure that you have the right mathematical model to correspond, that corresponds to what I described in, in words here. So this is sort of the programming tool. And then um, here is the, the question. So how do you evaluate this? Well, um, I would uh, plot R is equal to R1 plus R2 um, and, and, and look at, well, what is the asymptote? Um, what uh, uh, number of people got infected in the end? So it was 0. 0.6 approximately in the sample program I got. So you want to make that as, as low as, 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 as possible. Um, okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay, so guys, yeah, do you have any other questions? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the question. I think that was just somebody un unmuted themselves by mistake, or you say I could not hear the, any question asked, but I just could hear the TV in the background. <laughs> okay, I think um, there is no more questions. I, you just repeat the, the question which the students might do consider doing. And I think, yes, we could wrap it up. We would like to thank you uh, because that, that was a very interesting and uh, rather straightforward lecture. I hope in the next lectures, you're going to get into the genomics because also yesterday you've been at the lecture of the prof Nico Orki and we've heard about also some other pure like SIR and SIR modified models. So, and this is very fruitful and interesting kind of activity during the pandemic, especially. But I think whatever you are going to tell us about genomics would be will be much more interesting and much more things which, you know, it's much more difficult to, to find, you know, a straightforward tutorials. Let me put it this way in application to the, I don't know, COVID or any other pandemics, because as you very correctly mentioned, it's a relatively new tool from the point of view that, you know, for the first time, we really get the so easy access to the genetic data of the viruses, and this is very exciting and interesting time. Okay. Thank you very much, Martin. And I think we could stop for this morning session. And in the afternoon, there will be another lecture by myself on some introduction to the theory of open quantum systems. I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Okay, thanks for your attention.